Good evening. You're, most of you are lawyers, and the rest of you want to be lawyers. You know when the judge comes into the courtroom and says, good morning, good afternoon, with perhaps more enthusiasm than you genuinely feel. You say, what do you say? You say, good evening, Your Honor. Go ahead, try it again. Good evening. Good evening, good evening Your Honor. They're, they're getting ready to go to law school. So, <laughs> you know, when your mother asks you, did you learn anything this week? Now you have something tangible to... Uh, uh, to relate, uh, I'd like to thank my friend uh, Fred Lawrence, my longtime friend, and my longer time friend Bruce Singles for the very uh, generous introductory remarks. My father, who passed away in 1998, was here, were able to be here. He would have liked them. And my mother, who's 96 years old and very much alive, uh, if she were here, she would have believed them. So <laughs> it's really good. You can tell I'm talking to a group of lawyers. They naturally gravitated to the back. I'm glad there are not that many rows. Uh, but uh, I won't give you a court order to move up. Uh, it's, it's really good to be at uh, Brandeis and at a program sponsored by lawyers, uh, but also by the center. Uh, because I have a long association with Richard Goldstone, Justice Goldstone, the chair of the center. I'll be speaking to him tomorrow morning about the court I'll be talking about with you. He's an invaluable ally and advisor as well as friend. And uh, Dan Terrace, uh, who does a brilliant uh, job here. It, it, I, I consider myself, I, I don't have a Brandeis degree, uh, but I consider myself very much part of your extended family. Uh, about 13 or 14 years ago, I brought a young Cambodian American woman from Lowell, Chanda Oak here, uh, to interview uh, with the Transitional Year Program. Her parents are survivors of the killing fields of Cambodia. Uh, they are not we're not capable of giving her any guidance, nor was anybody at Lowell High School helping her. She happened to get a job in my son Matt's camp uh, in Lowell uh, to key, try to keep Cambodian kids out of violent gangs, get them into sports, because my son was a very good high school athlete. And uh, Matthew wrote her a nice letter of recommendation. We came for the interview. She was admitted. Uh, she finished that program. Uh, she went to Brandeis. And Brandeis allowed her, like others in the TYP program, to stay here in the summers when they really had no place else to go. Uh, she graduated in three years with honors, and now she's my daughter-in-law. Uh, she's very beautiful. If you read the vows section in the New York Times, uh, August uh, 20th, 2011, you'll read a very touching story, but it's very much a Brandeis story, and it's not a unique story. Uh, if you read Kevin Cullum's column in the Globe about Taisha Sturdivant, who was one of my Nelson fellows. Uh, her mother, her sole remaining parent, died while she was working for me. And I and the headmaster of her school, another course for college, urged her to come here. Her brother was in jail. Her mother had just died of AIDS. Uh, she came here and had a fabulous experience. Uh, she's now in Boston College Law School. Uh, and you know, this, you, you talk about, I, I remember coming to the 40th anniversary of the TYP program uh, when Chanda was an undergraduate, I think, still. And it was explained that this is a program that started uh, after Martin Luther King was assassinated in 1968. And many other schools started comparable programs. It's only Brandeis' <coughs> program that's endured. And... You know, it's a, a treasure. I'm really pleased it's named for my late friend Myra Kraft. Uh, I feel part of your family uh, because uh, Louis Brandeis is li literally uh, my hero. If you were to be sitting at my desk uh, in my chambers and look up to the left, you would see a large etched portrait of uh, Brandeis. And if you turn to your right, you would see a copy of a letter that I just gave uh, Fred uh, that Brandeis uh, wrote to Zechariah Chafee when Chafee was being persecuted for advocating the civil liberties and particularly rights to speak of uh, 
uh, beleaguered, uh, persecuted uh, immigrants and refugees uh, following World War I in the hysterical period of the Palmer raids. Uh, when my portrait was presented to the court, it was painted and presented to the court five years ago, uh, I'm holding a book and it's uh, Mason's biography of Brandeis, a free man's life. And I actually have inherited and I was wearing uh, the judicial robe that belonged to Felix Frankfurter, who was Brandeis's protege and my great friend and Bruce's former colleague and my uh, Judge Douglas Woodlock uh, talked about my lineage and that descent on that side from Louis Brandeis and on the other side from Oliver Wendell Holmes, who had Francis Biddle as his law clerk, who had Edward Levy as his special assistant, and then I was an assistant to Attorney General Levy, which, as I tell my clerks, refutes any idea of inevitable evolution to a higher <laughs> species. Um, I, and so as they say, it would be an honor and a pleasure to be here anytime, but it's very timely uh, to be here with Fred Lawrence now. Uh, I, I've spent time at Brandeis over the years. Uh, for various events, and I, I used to say to Yehuda Reinhardt, you really should find some way to cause the students in the community to know more about Louis Brandeis. And then it happened. I don't say there's any cause and effect, because Fred became his uh, successor. And he has brought Brandeis to Brandeis. Both, of course, uh, were both scholars, but uh, the most energetic advocates uh, for freedom of expression, uh, for civil liberties, and well aware of the tensions between the two uh, at times. Brandeis used to uh, regularly quote Goethe uh, and say, with regard to our civil liberties, we must struggle in each generation to truly possess what we've inherited. I think meaning that the struggles in any period are what remind us of our founding and fundamental ideals and determine whether they're going to continue to have vitality and integrity uh, in our era, not just be words on a piece of paper. And Fred has been at the forefront of that struggle here at Brandeis, which has been with other schools, not just this school, but at the epicenter of these issues uh, in our generation. And with his really thoughtful leadership, the whole community, and well beyond the Brandeis community, has been well educated by the experience. I know that Fred's especially beloved by the students. I got on a plane to Washington uh, about nine months or a year after he came, and I was seated next to college A student, it wasn't possible to miss where she went to school because she was wearing a, proudly wearing a Brandeis sweatshirt. So I started to talk to her and I say, uh, how's your new president doing? And she said, oh, President Lawrence is terrific. If I remember right, she said, he reopened the swimming pool, right? <laughs> and he comes to all the basketball games. He says, we love President Lawrence. And I know uh, that that means they will join the rest of us in missing you, Fred, very much, uh, but be enduringly grateful uh, for your service and for your leadership. So I know now I've made you overdue for your next engagement, but thank you. It was you. worth it. It was worth it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I've been asked <coughs> to come and talk to you about a proposal that I made uh, in two articles that were published last July, uh, each titled The Case for an International Anti-Corruption Court. Uh, I published a longer piece in the Brookings Institution on the same day, essentially a summary of it as an op-ed piece in the uh, Washington Post. And the thesis is that an international anti-corruption court, similar to the International Criminal Court but separate from it, is essential to combat what's coming to be called as grand corruption. 
uh, abuse of public office for private gain by a nation's leaders, or as Transparency International defines it, uh, acts committed at a high level of government that distort policies of the central function of the state, enabling leaders to benefit at the expense of the public good. And I've actually devised a statutory uh, definition modeled on the United States RICO law. But the fundamental thesis is that it's essential to prosecute and punish corrupt, power, uh, corrupt powerful officials in order to deter grand corruption and diminish its devastating consequences, which I'll describe. In the Washington Post piece, uh, I started by explaining some of my motivation for doing this, but also uh, why I'm genuinely hopeful, if not confident, that this seemingly quixotic quest uh, will succeed. And I talked about a young woman named Daria Kalunik, who uh, is 28 years old, or she was when we had this picture taken together about a year ago. I don't know if you can see, well, you can't see what it says, but it says Ukraine F corruption. <laughs> so you couldn't quite miss her at this grand gathering in uh, Prague uh, that the ambassador had organized. But uh, Daria was 28 years old. She's a lawyer. Uh, she had a master's degree uh, from a law school in the United States in Chicago. She had a one-year-old child. Uh, she was so indignant about corruption in Ukraine uh, that, at the highest levels, that uh, she was a leader of the Maidan protest. She actually had to leave uh, Ukraine for a month and go to Prague uh, before Yanukovych, the president of Ukraine, left, and they got into his compound and saw the uh, the extraordinarily lavish. Uh, wealth that he had accumulated as a public official. Uh, and she's still there uh, fighting very hard uh, because in some respects she says, you know, the new people are not any different or better uh, than the people we drove out, but there, there's hope. And part of my motive, but also uh, a great part of my hope is young people like Daria and lawyers. Uh, when the United Nations Convention Against Corruption uh, came into force in uh, about 2003, uh, the Secretary General of the United Nations uh, said that corruption was an insidious plague. And that's why this convention, now signed by 173 countries, was so important. And the facts demonstrate that that's right. Uh, it's long been known that corruption, particularly high level corruption, is very costly. Uh, it's estimated to consume about 5% of the world's GDP each year. Uh, developing countries lose more than 10 times to corruption what they get in foreign aid. And this isn't just an issue for developing countries. I, the first time I spoke about this international anti-corruption court was in St. Petersburg, Russia in 2012. Uh, the World Bank estimates that Russia loses 44% of its GDP to its corrupt shadow economy. So basically, half of it's going out the door, or was. I think Putin's trying to get some of it back. Corruption, corrupt governments provide safe havens for criminals and terrorists. Think of drug lords in Mexico or the nurturing environment that uh, Al-Qaeda has found uh, in places like uh, Afghanistan and Yemen. Uh, nevertheless, uh, the most serious consequences of corruption uh, are the way that they destroy democracy it destroys democracy and devastates human rights. If you look at the Transparency International Indices, you will find that the countries ranked as the most corrupt, 
correlate directly uh, to the countries uh, that uh, rank the worst in terms of respecting human rights. Uh, at the top of both lists, you'll find Somalia, Afghanistan, Sudan, Iraq, and Syria. Uh, this is becoming increasingly recognized, the close connection between grand corruption and abuses of human rights. So in 2013, the then United Nations High Commissioner for Human Rights, Navi Pillay, said, corruption is an enormous obstacle to the realization of all human rights, civil, political, economic, and cultural. Corruption violates the core principles of transparency, accountability, non-discrimination, and meaningful participation in every aspect of the life of the community. Uh, her successor, uh, Prince uh, Zaid Ra'ad Al Hussein of Jordan, uh, fully agrees. Uh, I met him in Geneva in October. I spoke to him again yesterday, no, last week. And uh, he's a major supporter of this proposed international anti-corruption court that I'll explain to you. He was instrumental in creating the International Criminal Court. Dan, we actually bonded because I started our meeting, which was supposed to last 30 minutes and ended up lasting 90 by talking to him about the talk that he gave here uh, uh, on essentially the nature of evil and reflections on uh, Adolf Eichmann and Hannah Arendt's take on it. A very, very profound uh, man, but he, he found Brandeis a, a hospitable place for a really special talk. And we started talking about that. He canceled two more appointments, and I, I walked out with a formidable uh, ally for this court. Uh, all three of those things, if I had written my articles two years ago, all three of those things, corruption is costly, uh, it provides safe havens for terrorists, uh, it's devastating to human rights, would have been true. And I don't think uh, my articles would have garnered the attention that they have but there's a fourth point uh, that's given a real urgency to combating grand corruption, and that is opposition to grand corruption is destabilizing many countries in the world. Uh, when I wrote my Brookings paper, looks like it could be a Brandeis paper, they got the same colors. Uh, I, I quoted uh, Justice Brandeis's uh, famous dissent, 1928, in Olmsted where he wrote, government is the potent, the omnipresent teacher. For good or for ill, it teaches the whole people by its example. Crime is contagious. If the government becomes a lawbreaker, it breeds contempt for law, it invites every man to become a law unto himself, it invites anarchy. And, and that's what we're seeing, dangerously seeing, around the world. Uh, last year, the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace uh, published a report uh, written by Sarah Shays, who's since written an acclaimed book on this. Uh, the report was called Corruption, the Unrecognized Threat to International Security. And just as I told you, if you match these up, you find the countries that are, have the most high-level corruption and the most corruption correlate directly with those who are most abusive of human rights. They also uh, correlate directly to those countries that are most dangerously unstable. As she wrote last year, 12 of the 15 lowest ranking countries on Transparency International's 2013 Perception Index of Corruption are scenes of insurgencies, harbor extremists, or pose other grave threats to international security. And you see many obvious examples of this. Uh, it was indignation at corruption by Mubarak and his family uh, that fueled uh, much of the revolutionary fervor in Egypt. Uh, it was that indignation uh, that uh, motivated Daria and people like her to risk their lives in Ukraine. And it's going on uh, right now in Nigeria. Uh, 
we might think that the constituency for Boku Haram are these rabid uh, fundamental uh, Muslims uh, who want this uh, religiously pure uh, government uh, in their country. That's not what uh, the experts uh, say. Uh, Boku Haram's constituency is people who are indignant about the corruption of the president, good luck, uh, Jonathan, and uh, others uh, historically in, in the rulers of Nigeria. Uh, and uh, this, so this corruption is creating all this instability. And I know this is of concern to Secretary of State Kerry, uh, frustrating our ability to deal with it. We would like to strengthen the Nigerian military to combat Boku Haram. But it's completely recognized that if you were to give $10 million uh, to the government of Nigeria uh, to buy military equipment, uh, only a tiny fraction of that would end up uh, with the military. It would be siphoned off in corruption. And as a result of that, I mean, I was surprised to have this pop up on my computer last week. Uh, my proposal, and me, uh, <laughs> I can't tell my mother this. I don't know if she'd be so proud if I'm now controversial in Nigeria, too. But uh, <laughs> by my proposal for an international uh, anti-corruption court has been injected uh, into the presidential uh, election campaign uh, with the election this week, I believe, because the leading NGO in Nigeria has, in a highly publicized way, it's in the, this is an article from The Guardian in Nigeria, but I'm told it's been on television and radio, uh, is calling on the two candidates uh, for president to uh, endorse Judge Wool's proposal for an international anti-corruption court uh, to demonstrate their express commitment to tackle corruption and impunity of the perpetrators if they're voted into power. Uh, so this is, I think, what's given such urgency to this issue. How do you combat grand corruption? It, it's no longer in, in 2015. I think if Sarah Shays was writing her book now, or report now, she couldn't call it an unrecognized threat. Uh, on February 19th of uh, this year, President Obama had a big uh, summit. Uh, uh, the UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon came, discussed the issue of corruption. Well, it was the summit on combating violence extremism. And the Secretary General said, we know that poisonous ideologies do not emerge from thin air. Oppression, corruption, and injustice are greenhouses for resentment. President Obama followed him, said essentially uh, the same thing. He said, when millions of people, especially youth, are impoverished and have no hope for the future, when corruption inflicts daily humiliations on people, when there are no outlets by which people can express their concerns, Resentments fester, the risk of instability and extremism grows. And uh, Congressman Jim McGovern, the uh, really dedicated co-chair of the Tom Lantos Human Rights Commission of the House of Representatives, uh, wrote to Secretary of State Kerry urging the State Department to support this proposal for an international anti-corruption court. And the State Department started by uh, explaining uh, the secretary's real concern about corruption, uh, saying corruption can drive instability and be exploited by terrorist groups to gain popular support. Without any doubt, corruption endangers U.S. national security. The State Department hasn't yet gone so far as to support my proposal, but we're working on it. They hadn't said no. Uh, uh, the international efforts uh, to combat corruption have grown a lot. They've been great. But if you, you look at the circumstances I just described, and nobody disputes the evidence, I think, uh, they've obviously been inadequate. In similar circumstances, uh, where there were egregious abuses of human rights 
and uh, real threats to world peace and security generated in 2002 the creation of the International Criminal Court to deal with violations of human rights, uh, war crimes, uh, crimes against humanity, genocide, and I say that that same type of international effort that would erode national sovereignty in certain circumstances uh, is justified now. Grand corruption depends on a culture of impunity. In a way, it's very simple. Corrupt leaders of countries do not permit the investigation, prosecution, or punishment of their friends, their families, or indeed themselves. And indeed, they punish the people who try to give integrity uh, to the laws that every country has, prohibiting bribery and extortion, money laundering, obstruction of justice. There's a vivid example for me in Turkey. Uh, two of uh, Bruce's former colleagues, uh, and I had been working, had been working in Turkey. Uh, there's a Justice Academy of Turkey which trains prosecutors and judges. Uh, there came into authority there a group of really uh, idealistic, honest, dedicated judges who wanted to uh, educate and create a much more honest, impartial set of prosecutors and judges in a country that doesn't have a tradition of either. And uh, the chief corruption prosecutor uh, developed formidable cases against two of the then Prime Minister, now President Erdogan's cabinet. Uh, and as they resigned office, they said publicly, you ought to get the President too. Uh, the prosecutor and he probably leaked it, this was not commendable, but uh, they went into the public domain, a tape recording that was said to be President Erdogan calling his son at home, telling him how to get $10 million out of the house. Uh, the prosecutor has since uh, had his portfolio uh, removed. He's someplace out in the provinces. Uh, my friends and colleagues uh, have been removed as the head of the just you know, the, it, it, from the Justice Academy of Turkey. They now have minor jobs as reporter judges in obscure courts, and they've been moved uh, uh, out of uh, Istanbul, or at least some of them. Uh, that's just the way the world works in many countries around the world. The International Anti-Corruption Court that I've been advocating would be an effective alternative forum for laws criminalizing bribery, extortion, misappropriation of public resources and money laundering that 173 nations have in the UN Convention Against Corruption uh, pledged to enact and enforce. Like the International Criminal Court, an international anti-corruption court would operate on a principle of complementarity. That means, so, so every country has say, laws against bribery and extortion by public officials. Uh, if a country, like the United States, uh, makes good faith efforts to enforce those laws, there would be no risk uh, that uh, its officials would be uh, prosecuted for corrupt conduct in the United States before an international anti-corruption court based on this concept of complementarity. But if you had the type of situation that's real that I just described in Turkey, uh, there would be uh, the risk that since Erdogan's own country uh, will not, in good faith, attempt to deal with serious charges of corruption at the highest levels, uh, that there could be uh, prosecution in an international anti-corruption court under this principle of complementarity, the principle under which the International Criminal Court operates. It would give many nations an incentive to strengthen and demonstrate their own capacity to combat grand corruption. Essentially, uh, this idea uh, that I was surprised wasn't out there, uh, 
before I put it out there, uh, is deeply rooted in the American experience. It's rooted in what Bruce and I were doing 30 years ago. Uh, in the United States, we don't rely on elected district attorneys uh, to investigate and prosecute corrupt state and local public officials. We don't do it because, as in Massachusetts, they lack uh, the legal tools, the laws, to do it effectively. Un under the laws of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, you cannot get a wiretap in a public corruption investigation. You can in a bookmaking investigation, but not in a public corruption investigation. But bookmakers don't make the laws, so you know, uh, 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 legislators do. Uh, we rely uh, on federal prosecutors, uh, federal agents like the Internal Revenue Service and the FBI. Uh, we rely on federal judges and juries. The, the idea for this International Anti-Corruption Court actually came to me after I conducted the trial of the former Speaker of the House of Representatives here, Sal DeMacy, and sentenced him to eight years in prison. And then I, about six months later, I was going to St. Petersburg to speak at this international legal forum on a panel on corruption. So I think, well, what are you going to say that an international audience might uh, be interested in? And it, it, it struck me uh, that there was a gaping hole in the international system. Uh, there is no credible threat of prosecution for the most corrupt public officials in almost, in many, many countries throughout uh, the world. So the court that I envision, and that can be fleshed out, uh, would employ elite investigators and prosecutors, impartial international judges. Uh, there are challenges to uh, creating such a court. Uh, people say, you know, why would these you know, corrupt leaders sign their countries up? But uh, Submitting to the jurisdiction of the court could be a requirement of existing treaties. As I said, 173 countries have signed the UN Convention Against Corruption. It's a fairly weak instrument. Uh, and some people think it's too fragile. If it actually had any teeth, uh, it wouldn't be there. And it's another issue that I could describe later. I can give you examples of why we might be better off uh, without it, if we're not going to give integrity to it, give it teeth. Uh, there's the OECD Convention Against Bribery. Forty countries have signed it, a recent transparent. And so it, 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 it goes on the supply side. Uh, if you pay a bribe to a foreign official, if an American pays a bribe to a Russian, you can be prosecuted here in the United States. It happens. Uh, uh, but... Uh, Transparency International's most recent study shows that uh, only eight or maybe nine of the countries that have signed the convention have ever had an FCPA type prosecution. We have almost all of them, which puts American companies at a disadvantage. It could be a requirement, submitting to the jurisdiction of the court, could be a requirement of being in the World Trade Organization. As recently as 2012, Russia was very proud to get into the World Trade Organization. They wanted to be there part of the global economic system. And it could be a condition for getting World Bank and other development bank loans. There's one advantage that my proposal has over the International Criminal Court, which it did not ultimately uh, have the United States joining, although we were very influential in the development of the idea. Uh, but in the end, uh, we didn't join. Uh, what I'm proposing is in the interest of American business. American businesses and business leaders are largely ethical, more ethical than most and many throughout the world. And until recently, when England, the UK, got into this more aggressively, they were the only companies that faced the credible threat of prosecution for bribing foreign officials. We've been at a tremendous disadvantage. This court would contribute to le leveling the playing field. There's another way that I've been learning that uh, 
this court could get jurisdiction, something I'm beginning to talk about a, a lot and learn more about. But as I keep saying, 173 countries have signed the UN Convention Against Corruption. They all have uh, laws against bribery and extortion. And the convention, as well as the Vienna Convention on Conventions, gives them a duty to make a good faith effort to enforce those laws. Uh, many, many countries are not. There's not effective monitoring, but if we had more effective monitoring, and not just through the UN, but through NGOs like uh, Transparency International, through whistleblowers who can use uh, you know, their phones uh, to show, as Navalny's people showed in Russia, uh, the, the, the report said that millions and millions of rubles have been used in some remote area at a specific place to build an apartment complex. So some young person goes out with his phone, takes a picture, there's nothing there. <laughs> Where the rubles go? Uh, Cyprus, probably. Uh, but <laughs> but uh, if there was effective monitoring and it showed that these people have, these countries have, and their leaders have signed these treaties saying, uh, you know, bribery and extortion is a crime, even when committed, especially when committed by the most powerful people. And they're not enforcing it, and as a result, we get Ukraine, we get Egypt, we get Nigeria, there would be a justification for the exercise of extraterritorial jurisdiction, as there is in the International Criminal Court, and I think the best place to exercise that extraterritorial jurisdiction would be in a international anti-corruption court. I'll finish by saying that I published these articles when I was on vacation last summer. I usually publish one every July. The year before I published one on the NSA controversy and how Attorney General Levy dealt with the first generation of that in the mid-1970s and how he would deal with it now. It, it, it got some slight discussion and disappeared. Uh, this one has attracted a lot of attention and the active interest of, of people, for example, is in Nigeria and Kenya. The UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, as I said, has pledged to make the establishment of this court a personal priority of his tenure. Justice Goldstone, the chairman of the center, uh, was one of the earliest supporters and an absolutely invaluable uh, advisor and advocate for this. The other, other leading international uh, prosecutors uh, strongly support this. Um, Maya, who we'll hear from, uh, uh, heard Luis Moreno Ocampo speak about this with me uh, at Harvard uh, last month. Jose Ugas, who prosecuted the dictator of uh, Peru, Fujimori, uh, is a strong supporter uh, and the chairman of Transparency International. Congressman McGovern is working hard for this. Uh, Mickey Cantor, who was the U.S. Trade Representative, the Secretary of Commerce in the Clinton administration, is working with me on uh, getting some WTO mechanisms that would be something of a foundation for the program. Some of you may have read the book about the really courageous man in Kenya, John Gathongo, who was brought in about dozen years ago when uh, a supposed good government uh, slate was elected. He was in charge of the anti-corruption efforts and then he realized that the people he working with uh, were totally corrupt. Uh, he's a big supporter. He just wrote that piece in The Guardian that I may have mentioned last week uh, about why Kenya needs the International Anti-Corruption Court. Transparency International, Human Rights Watch, Global Witness, the biggest NGOs in this area have endorsed it. And most significantly, I would say, uh, even more significantly, a lot of young people are excited about this, and some of them have signed the petition that's on the website that some young supporters have set up, anticorruptioncourt.org. Nevertheless, the most common criticism I get of this proposal is that it's impossible. And you know, shouldn't we be focused on more modest efforts? And I do think there are a lot of more immediately achievable goals like greater transparency of beneficial ownership uh, that should get a lot of attention and are totally compatible 
with what I'm advocating. I, I frequently quote, I did in my 661-page decision exposing Whitey Bulger's corrupt relationship with the FBI, sunshine's the best disinfectant, as Louis Brandeis wrote. That's true in the United States, where we have an independent media, where we have prosecutors and courts will do something when corruption is exposed. Alexei Navalny, he exposed enormous corruption in Russia. They lock him up. Uh, uh, but I, I, all these intermediate things, perhaps more quickly achievable things, I support. But this criticism that it's impossible, Nelson Mandela said, it always seems impossible until it's done. And I think I'm the oldest person in the room. Uh, I've uh, seen the fall of apartheid in South Africa, which seemed unimaginable. Uh, I saw the collapse of the Soviet Union, which was not foreseeable even a short time before it happened. And I think, I know, that with the support of lawyers and students, including, but by no means only, lawyers and students and young people throughout the world, uh, the International Anti-Corruption Court will prove to be possible too. So I'm very grateful, to, especially to have the opportunity to talk about it to you here at Brandeis. And I look forward to the discussion of it, which I know will teach me a lot. Thank you very much.